Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We are glad you could join us for another hour of good gardening. Call 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. And of course, you can also send us emailed questions for a future show. That address is byf at unl.edu. Do not forget to tell us where you live. Do attach those pictures as JPEGs. During the week, you can always check us out on our social media network. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So with that out of the way, Jody, welcome. And you've got a tiny little sample. Yes. Well, thanks for having me back again for this <laughs> great season. I brought a sample from an oak tree. These are oak gull bullet gulls, and they're called that because they look like bullets. But Jonathan mentioned about how plants form galls uh, when an insect is feeding, they put up some tissue. So what this one does, it's actually a wasp, and you can see the entrance hole or the exit hole, sorry, out of this gall, and out of there came a little tiny wasp. This is normally just an aesthetic issue, so people can prune those off if they can reach it, but it shouldn't do any damage to the tree. If there are large numbers, um, it could stunt the tree, so pruning would probably be best, but no insecticide is recommended for that. Excellent, and we are seeing them on a lot of oaks on campus, which mm -hmm. is, we're not happy about that. <laughs> Sorry, Jody, I know curious. it's an insect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, a teeny sample compared to your soil box from last yeah, week. Yeah, a little, I, I shrunk it down. <laughs> and uh, these are just some of the, the weeds that we see in our highly compacted soils like around campus. Um, and one of them's a grass, and one of them's actually a broadleaf that at this time of year kind of looks like a grass. So let's start with this one. This is a prostrate knotweed, and this is proof that summer is coming. It is a summer <laughs> annual, and so um, it's real small right now. And if uh, you're trying to control uh, this weed um, with a herbicide, it would be really effective because it's a weak little seedling right now. Uh, any kind of a you know, combination product would take this out. Um, the other one here is, is a grass, and this is the bane of many golf course superintendents. This is annual bluegrass, also loves compacted and wet soils. And pretty soon you'll start to see more and more of these little seed heads coming up that will aggravate your, uh, your, your grass allergies like mine. Um, you can't really control this with anything that's not, except for non-selective products or by, by pulling it out. But for both of these, the, the thing that's really the problem is the soil. They are an indication that our soils are not healthy Healthy, they're compacted, um, they're maybe too wet, they could use some drainage, they could incorporate some, some, some tillage through um, uh, aeration or incorporation of, of compost and try to keep people from going off or cars from going off the streets and the sidewalks and going into these areas. And so this is more of an indicator than it is um, you know, an actual problem. Try to maintain that healthy grass uh, density there and we won't have these problems. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. All right, Kyle, time for those pines. Time for those pines. So um, I brought in a couple of, couple of different uh, pine needles. I have uh, needles from a ponderosa pine. They're the longer one here. And also uh, needles from a Bosnian pine. And if you, if you look closely, you should be able to see some of these red, these red bands that are, that are showing up on these needles. And that's very characteristic of Dothostroma needle blight. Affects most of our pine trees. But one of the big things that I wanted to, to demonstrate with these two samples is Bosnian pine is fairly resistant to Dothostroma needle blight, whereas Ponderosa pine is very susceptible to Dothostroma needle blight. And you can see on the Ponderosa, where we have this, ne this needle death all the, from about halfway down, just right about where those red bands are starting, and on our Bosnian pine, we still have fairly green needles all the way throughout. So we always, I'm for management, you know, there are chemicals that can be applied, but resistant varieties are really going to be some of your best bets and your cheapest forms of control. Excellent, thanks so much. All right, Jeff, you get a pretty sample. Or kind of pretty. Kind of, well, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. It's not weeds, it's not galls or diseases. <laughs> so, come on. So, what we have here, the tall plant is uh, Cornelian cherry dogwood. So, it's one of our most reliable flowering shrubs we have. Forsythias are good. There's, there's a lot that are out there. But this one, year in and year out, does a great job. 
It can be fairly large. Um, you know, I would compare it much to a, a, a Euonymus. If you have a, a good size Euonymus, this, this is a similar size. It grows in the same sort of locations. Um, and it puts on uh, an edible fruit, um, so you can make syrup and jellies and jams out of it. It's a bit tart, uh, but I eat a lot of it. And uh, so <laughs> I guess I'm a bit tart. But uh, anyway, so it's a great shrub, does very well around here. So mm -hmm. good, reliable one. The smaller plant here is uh, Petasites or Butterbur. Uh, and so it blooms right now, really before, and I have a small leaf here that's just, just emerging as well, but it flowers before it leaves out. So it's a herbaceous perennial and it puts on leaves that are probably, oh, somewhere between 12 to 18 inches across. And this particular one is a variegated leaf and uh, it slowly spreads and kind of forms a, a colony. Uh, so it's a good ground cover. I have it on the north side of our home and, and it does well there and it's kind of filled in so I don't have to worry about mulching those areas, so. And it's also great for early pollinators. Oh, is it? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Mm. On campus, buzzing around, Jody, so there you go. <laughs> all right, first picture is yours. And this is a, what is this? She did find it dead on the carpet behind the sofa and she's glad about that. <laughs> she wonders what it is. Okay, um, yes, this is a pest. I can say that I don't even like this one. This is an earwig Ooh. and uh, they are omnivores. So they will eat other insects and the eggs, but out in the garden, they'll also get into uh, ripe fruit and flowers and petals. So they're not really great, but they're about an inch long. They look like a beetle, but they've got those long pinchers coming out of the tip of the abdomen. And that actually is a female. So if you see those circe or those appendages, uh, if they're straight, it's a female. If they're more curved, it's a male. And they use that for mating and eating, but they have wings. They don't, um, we rarely see them flying. I've never seen them flying, but they're tucked under um, those little wing covers. Uh, if you want to catch them in the garden, you can put like rolled up wet newspaper outside in the garden and they'll go under there and then you can, you know, knock them off into a bucket of soapy water, but otherwise just drying out the area, um, sanitation around there, it should be fine. But um, they will get in the house if you don't uh, seal up some of those entrances and gaps under the doors and windows, so. All right, excellent, thanks Jody. Okay, Bill, this is apparently a temporary fence Okay. that was built to keep dogs out of a construction area. Mm -hmm. And the fence came out and the, apparently dogs did what dogs do, which is run the fence. Yep. And what is it, how would it recover? What should you do to fix it? Yeah, what you wanna do here is do something to try to loosen up that soil. Uh, we talked about last week how during the winter, freezing and thawing helps to naturally aerate our soils, but all winter these dogs have been kind of working that, that soil down, especially uh, wet when it's wet in the spring. And so going out with some kind of an aerator is great. If you can contract out with an aerator that moves up and down vertically and doesn't just do one of those kind of rolling type aerators you see it used on a lot of lawns, uh, we can get a lot more holes uh, made. Um, if it's really bad, you could lightly till the area, either with like a hand tiller, kind of those vertical ones, you can kind of loosen the soil a little bit there, or you could till it with a, a, a rototiller and till some compost in. Compost really can help to restore the structure of the soil. And then uh, is, is the time right now to seed if you need to seed. And so get out there with some, some seed in Eastern Nebraska, we like tall fescue, uh, get that in right away and put some starter fertilizer on it with that, that um, pre-emergent herbicide means to try on, on the starter fertilizer and you should have no problem getting the area to recover uh, in uh, the next couple months. All right, don't put the fence back up. Yeah, keep the spot. fence away, yeah. <laughs> 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 Diversify the traffic routes. <laughs> okay, all right, Kyle. Uh, this is a viewer who has a uh, purple smoke bush. Okay. And she did some pruning and she found this, these, so yeah, she did some pruning. Ooh. And you can see the black on the inside of some of the cut stems on this smoke tree or smoke bush. Yeah, so that, um, I'm going to guess that that is a verticillium wilt. And a smoke bush is fairly susceptible to verticillium wilt. Unfortunately, that verticillium fungus can infect about 300 or so different species of plants. So there's a lot of stuff that is susceptible to it. However, it is primarily um, a uh, kind of a stress disease. And we, don't, we, we tend to see it a lot more 
on plants that have decreased vigor, whether that is due to adverse soil conditions or just an adverse environmental conditions. So with this smoke bush, um, you know, based on the fact that the outside of the, uh, of the cuts still looked pretty clean, typically verticillium, um, it infects the, that cambium tissue, so the outside, right underneath the bark. And if, so it looks like last year you didn't have much infection, and so I'd just let it go and continue to fertilize, give it maybe some extra love in this year, and should come back just fine. All right, excellent, thanks, Kyle. Jeff, this is actually a series of pictures from a viewer in Plattsmouth, and uh, she has apples, peaches, white pines. She has had some flooding in the past. This is not current year flooding. Okay. But she's concerned about, you know, the, the damage that occurs later or the fact that trees have struggled that went through that flooding previously. So sure. what are we going to say here? Well, I think with a lot of them, uh, you know, you're right, right now they don't look... Um, like there's a serious issue. Probably what has happened and, and may affect a lot of folks who are going through um, some, maybe in this case, relatively minor flooding would be kind of a sediment load over a period of time. And so if the trees were planted at the correct depth, you know, slowly uh, sediment or soil was added on top of it, which would affect uh, the amount of uh, soil that's on top of there, it affects the root growth, it affects the performance of the plants. So that would be one thing to consider uh, in this particular case is looking at the plants themselves, getting in there, digging around and pulling some of that soil back and seeing where you can find your roots, where the, the root flare is, especially on the deciduous trees and kind of get your soil level back down to that root flare area. All right, that's a good first step on something like that. Thanks. Well, you do know the old saying about weather in Nebraska, if you don't like it, wait five minutes. And this year, of course, has unfortunately proven to be very unpredictable. UNL climatologist Ken Dewey says there are trends that we can look at to get a good picture of what's coming up this spring and early summer. So let's take a few minutes to hear what kind of weather we can expect for the next few weeks. Here's Ken to tell us more. The winter of 2018-19 actually started out warmer than normal. And in early January, in the Lincoln area, for example, there was no frost in the ground, and it didn't look like we were going to have a severe winter until the middle of January, when a displaced Arctic air mass came down here and lodged itself over eastern Nebraska, setting up a disaster in many ways, because the ground now froze deep, the rivers began to freeze over with much thicker ice than they normally have in our area. And then when we had our first warm rain event in the middle of the month, all of a sudden that snowpack melted. In the urban areas like Lincoln, we were in good shape. The water quickly removed from our area. But in the lower areas near streams and rivers, the ice began to break up and it caused ice jams, which pushed up onto bridges and roads, destroying roads and bridges, and the water levels rose higher and higher, flooding much of the areas along the Niobrara, the Platte, and the Missouri. As we go into the next month, going into April, this pattern continues. A pattern of colder than normal, just for our area. Once we get into a pattern in the Great Plains, it seems to lock in for a while until something bounces it out. Going ahead into the spring, it's a slow emergence out of our winter dormancy. That's good, because if we have an early spring, we run the risk of an untimely freeze in April and even early May that can kill the buds. So a slow spring is actually good, but we're having a lingering effect of the ground is saturated, rivers are high, and the river forecast unit of the National Weather Service says we are at risk of having river flooding all the way into summer. And that's for two reasons. We already have high water levels, the ground is saturated, but more importantly, we're going into the wet time of year. This is the time of year where we get our heavy thunderstorms and spring rains. May is the wettest month ahead of us. June is the second wettest month. So we have two of our wettest months for our region ahead of us, and it doesn't bode well for stream levels. For us here in an urban area, it's just a nuisance. If we want to get out and do gardening, we're going to find the soil is saturated and we're going to find that it's still quite cold, so it's going to be difficult to have plants germinate if you put out seeds for a few more weeks. But that's the outlook, staying wet and staying cooler on into summer. 
You know, in any other normal year, wet weather conditions for the next few weeks would be really welcome news. So hopefully the places in the state that need the rain get it and we don't get any more complications with those areas that are, have been affected by the flood. And unfortunately, Mother Nature is slamming down on us as we speak in some parts of the state. So, all right, we have a little tiny insect for you, Jody. This is Diablo Nine Bark. They're older shrubs, uh, they're air layered, they, um, you know, so the big old canes then died, so you can see what <laughs> nine bark looks like in the winter, which is not much. But then there was a, uh, the, the, the uh, viewer cut them and pruned them and found this little beastie in there in the dead canes. Okay, so that's a borer. So that is a larvae or a caterpillar um, that hibernated over the winter and it will well, it's no longer, but <laughs> it's it croaked. Would. Its friends are going to turn into clear wing moths. Um, these do, uh, so it's a dogwood borer, and it, it will bore into the trunk and into the branches. Um, they will emerge, if there's any living, um, in the summer sometime, April to October. What you can do for what's left of that plant is to increase the vigor, um, take care of that plant, water it, um, you know, do some good mulching around there. If you do need to treat the trunk, um, there are products such as um, permethrin and bifenthrin that you can treat according to the label um, to run off that will kill the females and the, the young larvae that may be coming out. But they do lay their eggs on the branches and then uh, the larvae will find a way to get in. So if there's any cankers or calluses or cuts in the bark, that's how they do get in. So just take care of that shrub and see if we could get that going again. Jody, do they have a diameter size that they prefer? Do they prefer new, young growth, older growth? Um, I'm not sure that they do have a lot of host plants, though. Uh -huh. um, and from what I've read about nine bark, there isn't a lot of pests right. or right. major pests of them, so that's why it was really surprising hmm. um, for that. Um, but so, like, I don't know. I, I it's a lot of the ones I've read about are trees. Right. Right. So. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. All right, this is fun because when we have viewers that really love us here and they move other places, <laughs> Bill, this is a, a, a Minnesota picture with what is wrong with this turf. Uh, his mother is from Fall City, so okay. she asked for this, and I know you guys had one of the usual what is this discussions about what this is. We did, and so there's a couple of things we'd realized right away. It looks like it's probably a bluegrass lawn and there's a retaining wall, and it's hard to tell from the picture, but it seems like it's kind of sloping down towards the lip on a retaining wall. And so we're thinking, is it maybe salt damage? And then we realize, no, look at the scale, those whole, they're probably like six inch spots, so that probably doesn't make sense. And so things that would be obvious this time of year that would be, um, especially in Minnesota, would be uh, snow mold. And so likely snow mold where we see as it gets um, a little wetter, the snow might have lingered longer at the base of the hill there. Uh, you have a little enough, you had enough moisture and time for that snow mold to really do more damage and up higher on the slope. Um, potentially too, uh, when Minnesota had the really, really cold weather, um, if there's some, some species like ryegrass um, that are growing there that don't really like it super cold, those could have actually died off too. And we see that sometimes here in Nebraska where some of those weaker species die away. But we really think it's probably snow mold. Fortunately, it's gonna recover, it's superficial, the crowns aren't damaged. And so give it some time and some heat and next thing you know, it'll have a, a lawn, nice looking lawn again. All right, excellent, and I see nodding. A lot of nodding. Yep. <laughs> All right, thanks, you guys. All right, so Kyle, this is uh, a Rokeby viewer, Husker Red Penstemon, which overwintered well, and um, but also has these spots on it, and they're wondering what is that, and did that overwinter on the foliage, or how to control it? Those look a lot like some spots that I brought in on the Penstemon in my yard last year, mm -hmm. first episode, and um, so there, there are a few fungal leaf spots that the Penstemon can get. Based on the kind of that red halo, I'm guessing that this is uh, a Cercospora um, fungus that's causing these leaf spots. And as far as um, how it survived, yeah, that um, those fungal those fungal spores were able to survive our winter, and they they survived just fine on infected residue um, in the soil. And with this weather that we had last week, when it was I mean really nice, really warm, had still had adequate moisture, a lot of those fungal pathogens were able to um, become active and cause start to cause a little bit of disease. 
So as far as control, um, I probably wouldn't do a whole lot right now. If you, if you would like to, um, you can pluck off some of those leaves, or maybe you can spray it with a copper solution to, uh, to cut down on the, on the fungus. Or just enjoy the fact that the fungus color matches the stem. So. Exactly. <laughs> All right. It's coordinated. It's coordinated. <laughs> there we go. All right, Jeff, this is an Omaha viewer, a very loyal one, uh, has a wooded area and has found several of these growing on his property. He wants to know what is it and can it be eliminated? Because it's pokey. Well, it is pokey and it's, it's a wonderful plant. It's, um, it's a gooseberry. So, and I would guess it's probably Missouri gooseberry. That would be kind of the common one in this part of the state. And so they can spread a little bit. I've got, you know, I got currants and I have like three different currants, a couple of gooseberries, and I have a couple of these as well growing in the, in the yard too. So I, I like them. They do produce an edible fruit. Um, and, you know, you can cut them back right now a little bit. I'd leave, oh, if you were going to keep it, you could uh, keep a foot or so of it on, the, on there still. Uh, mulch around it and <clears throat> let it do its thing. You might have some gooseberries this later this summer. If it's something you want to get rid of, then you know a sharp spade and a little back, a little energy, you can get them out of there. They're not hard to get rid of. And get ready to do it again when the birds bring. Yeah, them right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right because they're coming from someplace. Right. So right, exactly. All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, each week we go back to our garden for updates, and although not much is going on outside, there is really plenty to see in our greenhouse. Let's take a minute to visit the Backyard Farmer Garden in progress. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we thought we'd show you what is going on in the greenhouse because Mother Nature is still telling us it is a little too early to do a lot of work in the garden. We have all of our seeds started up and growing, our cuttings taken, and of course our master gardeners do a wonderful job of getting those plants ready for us to install when the weather cooperates. You can see the quality of the plants, and of course that also means that we have taken really good care of them, making sure that we do not have any sorts of diseases. Insect pests in a greenhouse can always be an issue, but with that good care, we will be showing you some absolutely fabulous plants, including all the All America selections in the Backyard Farmer Garden. You'll see us out in the Backyard Farmer Garden getting ready to install all these wonderful plants to make it just as beautiful as always. All that gorgeous plant material is up, growing vigorously, hoping for sun, and it will go into the ground when it's time. All right, so we have just some regular old questions for all of you. Jody, this is a Fremont viewer who uh, said last year we had lots of cicada killers. And are they going to reoccur in those numbers this year? And what can be done to keep that from happening? It's hmm. a good question. <laughs> I do think they will be back because we have a great population of cicadas. Mm -hmm. And uh, those females that have provisioned their nests and laid eggs under the ground, uh, those should emerge. Hmm, how could we take care of that? Well, if we can water the lawn, keep it wet, so it's not as well drained, that's a problem. I mean, no, <laughs> kill no, the turf, kill say, this. <laughs> but um, shaded areas, it's it's gonna. No, we can't really do anything much about them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back and forth when I'm in your head. Well, I want to help. Like, oh. I want to help, but I I just think that they're going to be out there. It's part of nature. And the more cicadas we have, the more cicada killers we have, and you know, generally they're beneficial. Okay. So you you got it. We don't want to ruin our lawns, <laughs> but uh, by treating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bill. Uh, we have a question from a viewer who. Uh, has a big yard. She has used Roundup in the past. She would like a safer alternative. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion lately about uh, Roundup safety. And um, so what we're seeing is a lot of big companies that are big box stores are starting to pull it because they don't want to risk mm -hmm. them potentially selling something as they let the courts figure this out. And it's too long of a discussion to have right now about the pros and the cons. Maybe that could be a future segment. Uh, but there are other options out there if we're not seeing Roundup on the shelves. Uh, products like uh, Finale um, is, is another product that is a non-selective herbicide. Um, and then be careful with any of those kind of off the shelf or kind of home remedies because 
they sometimes can be more dangerous than these, these other products it can be that are tested and registered with the EPA and technically they're illegal. So um, there are other options out there. Just look very carefully and you'll be able to find them uh, in, your, in your garden center and, and uh, we'll kind of see how this plays out with the uh, different Roundup lawsuits. All right, thanks so much. Kyle, you wanted to revisit the eating of morels. I did, yeah. Uh, last week we touched on it, but kind of kind of went over it quickly and have gotten a lot of a lot of questions in the past week regarding them. So one of the one of the things that we talked about last week with the morels is they are very difficult to clean. Um, and with all the floods floods that we've had, it's going to be difficult to ensure that our that our morels are are clean and, and free of free of pesticides, free of any of these um, pathogens, other contaminants, things like that. But a lot of that, if you will, will be depending on where you're actually going hunting for your morels. And so if you if you typically hunt on some higher ground and you're out there and you're not seeing evidence of flooding, so you're not seeing just random debris showing up, um, it's corn stalks, grass debris parts of a boat. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're not seeing a lot of that random debris, then it's probably probably going to be relatively OK and, and, and fairly safe to, to eat those. If you are harvesting mushrooms from a flooded area, there is going to be a risk there. And we, unfortunately, we just don't know how much of a risk eating those morels would be. And since we don't know where any of that flooded water has come from, we don't exactly know what it's ran through. Maybe it was running through a, a feedlot upstream and collecting a lot, of, a lot of manure, or maybe it was running through an agricultural field and getting some runoff that way. So if you do see the evidence of flooding, just to play it safe, I would probably not, not, eat, those, not eat those morels and just wait for next year and they'll be, they should be popping. But if you do have a good high spot where you can hunt, then you're probably gonna be a little bit safer. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, Jeff, 10-year-old asparagus bed, what should she do this spring for it? Well, uh, I guess I'm assuming she's asking because either produ production has dropped or if we're having weed issues. Um, so something like that can be, you know, it actually it's kind of a labor-intensive thing. You're going to want to be in there, I would say, with a good garden knife or sharp knife, kind of cleaning that area out. Uh, if you have weed issues, you're going to have to do it. It's a lot of handwork. Um, so you, you need to get it in there, do that work around the, the existing plants. Uh, I would suggest coming in with some well composted uh, products. You can come in something that's been composted for a long time, some good topsoil, a mix of that, maybe 50-50, and getting in and kind of re redoing that soil as best you can around that, those plants. That would be the least invasive. Again, we don't want to use any kind of chemicals, any pesticides in there or herbicides. Um, and I think that'd be the safest way to do it. And watch for those spears because we have some ready already. Yeah, right. And they are starting to come up. Absolutely. Right. Rev your engines. Are you ready, Jeff? I've been practicing all winter. So yeah, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is a papillion viewer who wants to know when to cut back butterfly bushes. Cut them back now. If you haven't done it already, get them cut back, assuming they're alive. <laughs> All right, an Aurora viewer has moss on a very soaked garden. What would you recommend for moss on a soaked garden? Well, kind of what we were talking about before. We need to go in and renovate that soil, add some compost, some hoeing, some digging, kind of get that in and, and improve your drainage so it isn't a wet spot. All right, are there any raspberry varieties that we would recommend for Bertrand, Nebraska? Well, Heritage is a, a very good one, an effective one, but there are a lot of new, I planted some dwarf ones that I can't remember but there are some fun ones out there. So go to the garden center and find something. All right. <laughs> Heritage will be there, but there's some others. All right. Uh, what kind of soil would you recommend for raised beds? For a raised bed, you're going to want to do a combination of some topsoil, some compost. You might want to get some other organic matter and mix that in there. So kind of a 50-50 or 30-30-30, something like that. Are ferns going to be possible to grow in sewer? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, you bet. Right place, right plant. Nice job. Five. Five. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. Kyle. And yours Let's go, is really All hard, right. Kyle. <laughs> yeah. All right, are you ready, Kyle? No, no yes, no. Matter. No, yes, no. <laughs> matter. No, it doesn't. All right, is gamosis a disease? Yes. Um, well, it, it can be. It can be caused by bacteria just um, gumming up the inside of the plant. What can be done about gamosis? Uh, prune at ground level. Perfect. 
There's a Plasma viewer who said they had plum pocket last year. Can they expect it this year? Yes, uh, that's a fungal pathogen, and it's probably just hanging out and waiting for the right, right environment. All right, what is the window for spraying for the pine needle diseases? And this is from Blair. Uh, well, it really depends on the pine needle disease that you're talking about. With the Dothostroma that I, um, that I had earlier, um, kind of mid-May is when we want our first application, and then another one about four to six weeks later. If you're looking at Diplodia um, tip blight of your pines, you want to do your first, um, your first application in early, late, late April, early May for that one. All right, a gearing viewer has dark sunken spots in their red twig dogwood. Anthracnose. Will the cold weather deter slime molds? Some of them. <laughs> That's, that's not an answer. That, that doesn't really seem, that seems ridiculous. <laughs> some, like, some like it hot, some like it cold. Too late, they put that six uh, up there. Oh, yes. uh, what do they know? It's gonna go real slow and long. Oh, good, good. All right, Bill, are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. When should uh, pre-emergence be applied? Uh, we're getting to that window right about now, but it's gonna go all the way into um, to May, so no big rush. And, and use just the pre by itself. Don't use the combination with fertilizer. It's gonna grow right away. Don't add more fertilizer to it. All right, this is a Seward viewer who wants to know what is the best crabgrass preventer chemical? <clears throat> they all work pretty well, but there are some cases of resistance, especially with prodiamine, which is called barricade. And so if you're not seeing control with one this year, just write it down, remember it, put it on, write it on your wall in your garage so that next year you don't use that one. All right, is it time to do step one fertilizer now? Uh, I don't like the step one right now because the grasses are gonna start growing rapidly out of the winter, so why make it even worse and have to mow more? All right, this is a Brady viewer who wants to know, is it time to do weed and feed and crabgrass killer now? I just don't like the feed, the crabgrass maybe, the weed depends on if it's a summer annual, it's germinating like the not weed, then maybe if it's a winter annual, then no, this is not a lightning round question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <what? laughs> That was like, it, just keep pushing the button in there. Yeah. It would have been. <laughs> four, four answers right there. Just say it depends. Yeah. It would have been. I, I don't, I'll just say I don't really like the, you know, the, the, the ten step programs that have everything. Like, if you have the past controlled, if you don't have the past, then. Right. You just needed to answer it like a lightning round question and then ask me if you could follow up later. I guess. <laughs> All right, Jody. Oh, okay. Okay. This is a uh, Gothenburg viewer who had leaf cutter bees last year and wonders if they can expect them again this year. Yes, and I hope so. They should all be in their tunnels, whether it's, um, you know, in the tubes you've provided or tubes in nature. All right. Tiny little ants seem to be coming into the houses now. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. Every spring it happens. If you smash them and you sniff them and they smell kind of bad, then they're odorous house ants. They love sugar. Tarot's going to work good. If it's pavement ants, that and a lot of other types of bait. All right. Which is the ladybug that bites and what color is okay, it? Okay, that's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And it's multicolored, so it could be yellow, orange, red, could have spots, could have no spots. They're the ones who overwinter in houses, but they do land on people and bite them for no All reason. All right. Um, people are seeing orange and black butterflies oh, newly yeah. hatched. They were the ones in that beauty picture. Um, mm -hmm. Those are red admirals. Uh, some of them will overwinter in rock piles and things like that, so that's why we're seeing them, and we'll see them for a long time. Okay, we have somebody who said they saw a creature like a moving mustache after... Ooh, house centipede. <laughs> I call them ha a moving mustaches as well. <laughs> too excited there. I think in honor of Masters Week that lowest score wins. So. I think in honor of our first... Wow, look at trophy. that. Trophy, our traveling trophy oh, goes wow. to oh traveling gosh. trophy, Kyle. You oh, know, and I don't think I'm on that. next week, so I guess I'll have it for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes right back to me. <laughs> All right, Jeff, what are our plants of the week? Well, we have two fun things, kind of in the, the food uh, theme of tonight. So our, our shrub here is Nanking Cherry. So it's a prunus and uh, it does well here. It's relatively short-lived. If, if you get 10 years out of it, you're doing pretty well, but it'll get up to oh, eight, 10 feet tall in, in certain places I've had it that big. And then it produces a, a small, sweet cherry. So that's kind of fun to have. Um, and then the perennial we have here with the nodding flowers, that's prairie smoke. Uh, Kim tells me it's in threes, and then it's followed by its smoky seed head. Um, 
And what, low, so it's very low growing again, so it's gonna like full sun. Both of these are gonna want nice sunny locations. Pretty nice combination. Eat one, enjoy the other. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Okay, picture time, Jody. This is someone uh, who is in Riverdale, Nebraska, and they have an ash with holes, and there would be the tree itself, and she thinks it looks like somebody took a drill to them. A little hard to tell in the, in the closer up, but you took a look at that and you thought perhaps this is yeah. what? So that looks like a native ash borer, and we have quite a few. Um, but it also looks like it's been damaged by a woodpecker, just the mm -hmm. way that the bark is torn up like that. So I don't think this is emerald ash borer, but we do have native borers. Um, what I would recommend is uh, probably to consider removing this tree and replacing it with another one. Especially since it didn't look like it was in the greatest Yeah, condition. it doesn't look like it would be a good candidate for treatment. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of other great trees out there. Good answer. <laughs> All right, Jeff, or Jeff. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> I was looking at Jeff for the tree. <laughs> she just has skip it. <laughs> no, it's William, actually. Oh, it is. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of dog damage questions um, from two different locations, two different viewers. Mm -hmm. What is the best course of action to get this turf from dog damage back to green. You know, I've been having great success dropping my seed in and then going over it with a power rake, a uh, dethatcher. And mm. it just beats that seed right into the soil. So do it when the soil is still kind of damp. Um, but then that seed gets buried in there, especially bigger seeds like tall fescue can really get pushed in there. I and mean, you can do it with an aerator too. If you have compaction, you can put the seed down and then aerate over the top, break those cores up, let it be a little top dressing to kind of bury that, the, the seed. Again, a starter fertilizer, and we really like that fertilizer that uh, has the mesotrione in it to control the summer annual grassy weeds like crabgrass. You do those things and you should have good success. You know, water a couple times a day, but with those seeds being deeper in the soil, you don't have to water every hour, just maybe twice a day and you'll be fine. Uh, cold and, and rainy days, maybe you don't have to water at all. And uh, it's worked really well for me the last couple of years in my house. Excellent, but it's an every year deal. Yeah, there's, it's this, between the salt and even some herbicide residue that's in the urine of the dog, uh, that's what causes the damage. And there is gonna be some regrowth too. So you're gonna get some to come back, plus you're gonna have uh, uh, the new seeds you're gonna put down. All right, excellent, thanks Bill. All right, uh, Kyle, this is a person in Lincoln who has winter creeper, the broadleaf, and it's gone vertical, which okay. it does. Has seen these strange streaking and what looks like rusty spots. What is this and what can be done about it other than tearing the plant out, which is probably a good idea anyway. The first thing to do would be to send me a sample uh, of that because I was having a really hard time um, finding, finding anything particular. There are a few, there are a few fungal pathogens that, that can cause, um, cause those leaf spots, <laughs> but the, the streaking almost makes it seem maybe a little bit more viral, but then we have this other nice spot on the bottom that has a nice halo that is pretty typical of, of a fungal disease. Um, so really, I would, I would love, to see, love to see one of these samples. Otherwise, yeah, you may just want to uh, cut it like Kim said. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, Jeff, this is a, uh, an acreage or a, a big property on the west side of Lincoln, planted these particular spruce, uh, spring of 2017, checked the soil, watered accordingly, they were mulched, no antidesiccants. They think that's the problem. What do we think is going on mm -hmm. here? Well, the antidesiccants may have helped uh, with this. So there could be a few things. Um, these spruce are susceptible to um, kind of th through the winter, a couple of things. One is winter drying. So if the soil froze and we had a, a sunny day, they're, they're trying to go through their process and so there's just no water available to them so that would dry them out. So there's that part of it. And then kind of along with that is what we would call winter burn. So again, the same sort of thing. We have a nice sunny day, maybe there's uh, moisture available, but then we have a sharp cooling overnight. And so then that tissue freezes overnight. And, and as that happens repeatedly, you may get that sort of thing. So at this stage, even though they don't look great, I would be tempted to wait a little bit and see if those buds are still alive and see if you get some greening up. 
Uh, I would continue, I know we've had kind of a wet period here, but I'd continue to check those. I'd give that the, the screwdriver test, check the soil and make sure that we actually have good soil moisture there. That'd be my other concern. And certainly around the, the root ball areas, because mm -hmm. if they're recently planted, it doesn't do any good to check 10 feet out away from the tree. We need to check right at the base of the tree. All right, good advice, thanks Jeff. Well, pretty much every, anybody who gardens from novice to pro will probably have a tomato plant or two. It's by far the number one homegrown fruit, so we thought we'd make a series of features to cover all the bases of growing them the right way. Backyard Farmer panelist John Porter talks about starting seeds indoors. Oh, hey there. Welcome to another season of Backyard Farmer. You know, we get a lot of questions about growing tomatoes here at Backyard Farmer, so we thought, why not take you all the way through the steps? So throughout this season of Backyard Farmer, I'm gonna be going from seed to plant to plate with tomatoes, and we're gonna get started by growing them indoors, but as you can see here, it's a little bit too dirty back here, and, uh, <laughs> a little dusty even though spring has sprung and it's in the air so we're going to head somewhere else so follow me well now that we've got to a more acceptable place to start seeds we're going to talk about what we need to look for on our seed packet so you're going to take a look at your seed packet it'll tell you what type of tomato you're looking for so you would like a nice slicer do you want a sauce tomato for canning? Do you want cherry tomatoes? You're also going to look for the days to uh, maturity and how long it's going to take for you to start before uh, the, the last frost so that you know when to start them. But that's just a guide. A lot of people make a mistake that they think that you have to have them started by that date. But the tomato season, you can get them started way longer than that. So you have your seeds. You have some nice soil -less seed starting mix that's sterile so we don't have diseases. And we have containers so you can use ones that you've bought you can use ones that you've recycled from years past or you can go to your kitchen recycling bin and you can pick up some containers here just make sure they have some nice drainage so that we can have the water coming out of there then the next step we're going to put our nice soilless mix in there we're going to get it nice and full there we go and then we've opened up our seeds here we're going to drop a few right there on that seed starting mix and work them in. So you notice they're all in one container. What we're gonna do is after they get their first set of true leaves, we're gonna put some potting mix in individual containers and move them over so that then we can get them ready for their time in the limelight. Well, now that you've got them planted, your hard work is done, but it's time for them to work their magic. You wanna keep them evenly watered and keep them a little bit warm too, around 75 degrees. Then once they get sprouted, you're gonna need a little bit of light. So you can use some fancy equipment like what I have here, or if you have a great sunny window, you can use that as well. You just need about 16 hours a day, whether it's this or sunlight. Keep them happy and in a few weeks, you'll have some great plants that are ready to go. So throughout the season on Backyard Farmer, as we're talking totally tomatoes, we're gonna share the lessons that we learned at the end of each of these segments. So today we talked about looking at the back of that seed packet for the information like the start time and the type of tomato. We talked about looking for the seed starting mix that's sterile and also using containers where they're recycled or we buy them at the store. We also talked about the need for light. We need about 16 hours, whether it's from a supplemental artificial source or from a sunny window. So the next time when I'm on Backyard Farmer in a few weeks, we're gonna talk about picking out tomato plants at the garden center, just in case this didn't work out or you didn't get them started in time. As John said, we will be hearing from him on a regular basis and following the way he tells us how he grows <laughs> seeds, <laughs> which is sort of fun. Yeah, indeed. Fun. Yeah. All right, uh, your next picture, Jody, is a rain garden in Fairbury, has obedient plant up, which is of course disobedient in a lot of locations, and has these little holes that they thought maybe was an insect this early. Okay, I don't, I think it's an insect, and I thought it may, might be slugs, because I have seen some slugs, but I don't know, could it be some kind of fungus, Kyle? It could be. Well, there, are, um, there are some shot hole fungi that can cause similar symptoms, but 
wouldn't expect them to be active this early. Mm -hmm. um, that, and so, I mean, that's kind of a later, later into the summer thing. So probably not a shot hole fungus. Maybe sandblasting, if it's been windy, I... <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. or from the cold, I don't know. But what I do know from the obedient, disobedient plant is that it's just cosmetic and it should be totally fine, so you don't have to do anything about it. Okay, awesome. All right, Bill, your turn. This is a, this is a tricky one. And it is a Beatrice viewer. She sent us a picture last week and it was um, in the lawn. And I asked her for a close-up because I thought this is what that was. She wants to know what to do about it. Yep. Um, this is one where I was like, really, this is in the lawn? This mm -hmm. is uh, Eastern <laughs> Red Cedar. Um, and so typical, not the typical um, uh, weed that you'd see in your lawn, but we're seeing more and more. Uh, it is native to the U.S., but it's just kind of been spreading across all of our rangelands. Uh, goats are very effective, so if you want to get some goats, they like to eat it. But I'm assuming that's not an option. And uh, so what you can do is you can cut it right down at the base. Usually mowing doesn't do it because it doesn't cut it clean enough. And so it, um, if you can cut it below the lowest branch, then it can die. Um, another option, chemically, like things like Roundup aren't actually not very effective. They're, they'll kill the grass around it more than they'll kill the, the cedar. Um, and so, uh, you know, 1% concentrations of Tordon can be possible, something we don't usually talk about on this show because it can cause a lot of problems, mm -hmm. but it is something that, you know, in range management is their kind of their go-to, just put a little bit on, spot treat, you're not gonna be treating everything, and you could still burn the lawn, it shouldn't kill it, but uh, interesting to kind of see that guy. You can also dig it out too. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't, yeah. long have to spray it. Can we just get it out of there the best we can? Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in, parts in Lincoln too where, you know, parks where they've mowed it and there it sits. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Kyle, um, this is a viewer who has what looks like a service berry. Okay. She was doing some pruning, um, dark, dark pieces, doesn't really know, so you can kind of see a dark stripe down the, the one yeah. branch. She cut it and then she also thinks it's a canker of some sort. What do you think? Yeah, there's definitely something something going on. Um, could be could be a canker. That's a very a very general term for a, a lesion on, on woody tissue. But the big thing with this, especially when you can see it really well on this picture is how we have that discoloration almost all the way around that branch too. So that means whatever, whatever is causing that discoloration, whatever is causing that canker is fairly aggressive and has, is cutting off a lot, of, a lot of nutrient flow. So you'll probably need to start thinking about replacing that, replacing that one. All right, thanks Kyle. All right, this is a interesting picture. This okay. is here in Lincoln and she says, what could be going on here? What kind of tree is this other than former? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it matters. Um, it's unfortunate is what it is. It really is. So, and I think that's just a lesson to all of us that if you have a newly planted tree and you are putting in some supports for it for the first season, first few months, um, it's important that we remove those. Um, you know, they can't stay on forever. And if you've had it on, if you think, oh gosh, I've had one on my tree for a year or two, it's time to get them off. Um, so it inhibits root growth, it inhibits diameter growth. Um, so you're not helping the tree. Right, choke hold. Yes. All right, <laughs> thanks. Well, we have a whole bunch of announcements tonight. So the gardening world is kicking into gear. The first is container fruit and vegetable gardening with John Porter, Nebraska Science Festival. And we have all sorts of information on the screen for that one for this coming Monday. Our second announcement of the evening is bugs and bourbon with Jonathan Larson <laughs> and Jody Green, also at the Science Festival, but on Wednesday of this week, more information also on the screen. Spring Affair coming up April 26th and 27th. We have information on the screen for that one, of course. And finally, we have Northeast Nebraska Master Gardeners Plant Fair and Market, Friday, April 26th in Norfolk. So lots and lots and lots of things going on. All right, Jody, we have some questions here. Uh, this is a Fremont viewer near a flooded area. It found small dark colored worms the size of a, of a pea when they roll up on the sidewalks. Okay, so those are millipedes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
definite, uh, definitely a problem where there's going to be high moisture. Mm -hmm. um, did she say inside or outside? Uh, she said they roll up on the sidewalks. Yeah, yeah, they're going to do that. Basically, you just want to sweep them up. There's not anything that you want to spray for them. Um, seal up any holes so they don't get inside. They'll get kind of inside the foundation, but they won't multiply inside, but they do curl up and get crunchy, so just vacuum them up. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, Bill, <laughs> near Kearney, this is fun. Zoysia versus brome, which is more invasive and tougher, which would invade the other? Would the brome stop the zoysia? Or the zoysia stop the brome? You know, I would think that the z it depends on the environment, right? The one that's most adapted to that area is going to be the one that's going to win. And so if it's going to be a, a, a drier environment, a hotter environment, um, the zoysia is probably going to win because it's warm using grass. Uh, if it's a little shadier or wetter, then the brome grass uh, may win. So I think it really is going to depend on those environmental factors and so kind of letting us know which one is going to be the, uh, the dominant, uh, the grass of that location. So. Kind of hard to say without knowing exactly about the environment. I think that sounds like a research question. You gonna fund it? <laughs> 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 All right, Kyle. Um, this is a, a viewer who had blight in tomatoes last year and wonders how many inches of soil does he have to remove to treat that. He wants to take the top X number of inches off use it on a berm, he, he's wondering if the blight will move with the soil. Well, it, the, the fungus, it's, it, it would move with the soil, um, so it would, be, it would be in the new berm that you, um, to wherever, wherever you move it. I don't know if I would recommend the, the top soil removal. Um, that can get fairly expensive, <coughs> and the, that, fungal, that fungal pathogens, it can survive, it can be a little ways down in the soil profile too, so you might be having to look at removing six, eight inches of, of soil out of that. Um, so really, uh, blight control, um, water management. And so make sure that you aren't, you aren't doing that overhead irrigation, you're not splashing a lot of soil up onto the leaves, and you're also make sure that you're removing any diseased leaves at the end of the season too. I think that's probably going to be much more effective than, than the topsoil uh, removal. All right, thank you, Kyle. Jeff, this is a cedar or a Hadar, Nebraska viewer, and they have um, high protein fish based dog food that is expired. She doesn't mm -hmm. want to feed it to her dogs. Right. Can she scatter it over the garden, till it in as fertilizer? I don't see why not. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, you don't know what you're getting from an analysis standpoint. You don't know how much protein you're getting, but or how much uh, nitrogen you're getting, but um, yeah, it's not going to hurt anything. All right, so, excellent. Yeah. Sort of like burying a fish. Yeah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> All right, this is uh, Jody. This is a Valley County viewer. S has secondhand books, and something is eating them. Looks like worm damage. Oh, okay. This could mm. be uh, silverfish or fire brats. They do um, eat fabric, and they like the glue of, of books mm -hmm. and book bindings. It usually has to do with humidity, but if you got them that way, I would probably bag them and put them in the freezer for a little bit to see if there's anything in them, but I would just do uh, climate control where you're gonna keep the books next. All right. Bill, uh, Verdigree and lots of other locations are asking, again, about soil. What are we gonna recommend for soil tests, or are we gonna wait and see with extension on flooded soils. We've been getting a lot of questions on this and, and is the soil safe? What do I do with the soil? And, and so there's, I think some of that is we're gonna have to go refer to our, our NRDs for like where do we put soil that we pull off of our landscapes. Um, and then when it comes to the safety of the soil that's underneath, say we had an old raised bed and we pulled the muck off, is it safe to, to plant in that? Um, I think extension is going to be learning more and more as we sample. Um, labs are going to be difficult, though, to, uh, to tell us those types of things. All right, so that's a, we will get back to you and mm -hmm. we will keep you posted mm -hmm. as, as a team. Yeah. All right, excellent. You know, uh, always good, and Kyle passed that this way before I close the show, so I know <laughs> you give it back. <sighs> All right.